welcome to worship at Cannonsburg UP Church on this fourth and final Sunday of Advent before we get to celebrate Christmas. Whether you are joining us live on Facebook or a little bit later on uh, YouTube uh, or on the website, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship together, whatever that looks like. Uh, we are continuing uh, to worship online uh, uh, only through the uh, 3rd of January. And so uh, you can join us uh, at any one of those. Obviously, if you're with us now, you're joining us, uh, you found a way. But hey, there might be an easier way if you're not aware, uh, yet we are uh, going on uh, YouTube and you can uh, go to YouTube and uh, find our channel pretty easily. Uh, I encourage you to, to subscribe to it yeah, if you're not already. This might be an easier way for you to connect with us and worship. I got to tell you, at home, a uh, little bit later this morning, we will be gathered uh, at worshiping as a family together, and, and we'll use the Facebook app because, uh, or sorry, the YouTube app because it's a little bit easier for us uh, to get on the television, uh, a little bit better for us than gathered around a small screen. And so if that's better for you, I encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, we will be gathering, uh, we have three worship services on Christmas Eve at 7 and at 9 and at 11 p.m. And I encourage you, whichever ones of those uh, make sense for you and your family, join us for that. We're very excited uh, for some very uh, neat, different, uh, but very special uh, things that will be happening on Christmas Eve for our worship. And so we invite you to join us for that. Again, whether it's uh, Facebook or YouTube or on uh, the website, we look forward to celebrating together on Christmas Eve. Hey, uh, I want to make mention of uh, something and someone very special this morning. Uh, I want to mention uh, someone that many of you know, but maybe some of you don't, uh, and that is Dave Garrison. Uh, Dave is a, uh, a member, a deacon. Uh, he actually serves as the moderator for deacons. I think there's even a photo of him uh, that uh, that we have. There he is, uh, just a couple of uh, just a couple of weeks ago or so. Took this photo here, and. Uh, Dave is a wonderful, wonderful servant of God, serving sacrificially here for so, so many years. Uh, but Dave has had a very challenging uh, story. Uh, when Dave was in his 30s, he had his first heart attack. Three young boys in the house, and Dave had a heart attack. Uh, Dave, uh, with diet and exercise and, uh, and uh, medication, was able to keep uh, things going for uh, for quite a long time, but finally, 18 years ago, Dave got to the point where he absolutely needed a heart transplant, and it was December 16th, 18 years ago, uh, that Dave received uh, essentially his second opportunity, his second lease on life. If you uh, if you know some of Dave's story. You probably know some of the harrowing experiences uh, that Dave had leading up to that heart transplant, where, where there was a nurse who was literally pumping his heart for him uh, because the machine that he had been using to do that, battery died. Uh, but we are so, so grateful uh, to be able to celebrate with Dave uh, this 18-year anniversary of his heart transplant. Uh, if we had been gathering normally uh, this past Sunday, we or uh, today, we would be down in the fellowship hall between worship services with a cake and with decorations celebrating uh, Dave's uh, second lease on life. Uh, but as Dave would be clear to say, not just celebrating Dave, but celebrating the amazing thing that God did in Dave's life. And I love to be able to share that with you this morning because if we go back just a couple of weeks ago what were we talking about how does our hope grow but sharing the good things that God has done in our lives and the lives of the people around us you know when we hear that story different parts of it when we hear what God has done in Dave's life I think it is a tremendous encouragement God has done that what will God do in the coming days and weeks and months and years. So if you are uh, connected all with Dave, reach out, uh, say congratulations to him. Uh, he just had a, uh, a checkup uh, that went very well. So we're so excited to celebrate with Dave and with Cindy uh, this, uh, this day. 
couple other things. The pop-up food pantry uh, just had its last distribution for 2020 and is tentatively restart. Uh, tentatively scheduled to restart on January uh, the 7th. That'll be the first Thursday in January. Uh, and so uh, if you are in need, though, uh, if, you are, if you are in real need, you can still contact the church office. We, uh, we have ways to be able to, uh, uh, to get emergency food to anyone. We don't want anyone to go hungry, uh, this, uh, especially this holiday season. Hey, if you're not already aware, uh, Sunshine Station, uh, not only has it gone back online, but it is online. And every Sunday there is posted uh, the, the large group experience that we would have done together, but we have posted online. Uh, there's music, there's a game, there's a story. Uh, and so uh, if you've got a child who would normally be part of Sunshine Station, while we're not gathering together uh, excuse me, in person right now, we are having that experience online. So I encourage you uh, to, uh, to go to the Facebook page for Sunshine Station uh, resources. You can check that out. There's a whole bunch of wonderful stuff on there. I encourage you to check it out uh, to have a great uh, experience to help our kids grow in their faith and connect with God. Uh, one last thing, again, Huge th thank you to everybody who continues to financially support uh, our church uh, during this season. Uh, if, uh, if you need to know how, you can go to the website, click that Give Now button. It is so simple, so easy. You can still send checks into the church office, and uh, that helps us continue this ministry uh, during this very challenging time. Uh, with that said, I want to hand it off now uh, to, well, to our family who is going to help us light the Advent wreath this morning. Good morning, church family. Today, the fourth Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of love and we relight the candles of hope, peace, and joy. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus came out of love as our hope, peace, and joy. During the past few months, we've experienced lots of um, acts of love uh, during all of this craziness. And one of them was at the beginning of the summer. And we were out on the porch and we got a special delivery from one Miss Retta. And uh, not only with her cheerful demeanor and her smile, um, but she brought a whole big box of cookies. And we were very excited about these cookies. Um, but what particularly was very touching and what we thought was very loving was that she also gave each of us a card. And in each of those cards, she wrote us a very special message, particularly for that person. So that was um, just one of the acts of love that we experienced in the last little while. All right, so for our first reading, we get this from the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, where we find these words. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. From Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. <clears throat> and from the Gospel of John we hear, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 34 through Let's pray. Teach us to love, O oh Lord, as you have loved us. Following Christ's footsteps, may we love others selflessly because you have so selflessly loved us. As we prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth, fill our hearts with love for this community and for the whole world so that they might know of your love because we love them first. Help them to know your Son, our Savior. 
as we share his love. Amen. 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 Bye, guys. Bye. Good morning, kids. I want to take a few moments to talk just with you all this morning. Hey, we are, what is it, five days? 
four days maybe if you're one of those opening gifts on Christmas Eve crowd, or five days for, let's be honest, the right, you've got to open your gifts on Christmas Day. Uh, how do you get your gifts from Santa if you get them on Christmas Eve? I, I don't even know how that would work. Five days away from opening Christmas gifts. And uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, man, I couldn't wait. I was so, so, so excited. I remember the days, counting down the days to when I finally got to open my gifts. And the story that we're picking up this morning, the very last Christmas story from the Jesus Storybook Bible is all about, well, it's all about gifts. And so we're going to pick it up. We've got the pictures on the screen. This one is called the king of all kings. Far away in the east, three clever men saw the very same star. The star that God had put in the sky when Jesus was born. They knew it was a sign. A baby king had been born. They had been waiting for this star. They knew it would come. He's here, they shouted. He's here. And I'm sure if you'd been there, you would have heard them laughing and dancing and singing until the sun came up. Well, at dawn, they packed up their camels and wrapped gifts for the baby. They brought their most precious treasures of all, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. Special, sparkly, lovely smelling, gleaming things just right for a king. Three, the three wise men, actually, if you'd met them, you'd have thought they were kings because they were so rich and clever and important looking. Well, they set off. They rode their camels across endless deserts, up steep, steep mountains, down into the deep valleys, through raging rivers, over grassy plains. Night and day, day and night, for hours that turned into days, that turned into weeks, that turned into months, and months until at last they reached Jerusalem. Jerusalem was by far the most important city for miles around as, as anyone can tell you. That's where a palace would be, and kings are born in palaces. So that's where they went. But they were in for a surprise. They went to see King Herod. Surely he'd know where this baby was, but he didn't. In fact, he didn't like the sound of a new king. It made him cross. He didn't want anyone to be king except him. But Herod's advisors told the three wise men what was written in their books, what God had said about the baby king. Go to Bethlehem. That's where you'll find him. Suddenly the star they had been seeing in the east started moving again, showing them the way. So the three wise men followed the star out of the big city along the road into the little town of Bethlehem. They followed the star through the streets of Bethlehem, out of the nice part of town, through the not-so-nice part of town, into the really not-so-nice part of town, down a little dirt track until it struck right over a little house. But wait, it wasn't a palace, and there weren't any guards or servants or flags or red carpets or trumpets or anything. Did they get it wrong? Or was this what God meant? Sure enough, in that little house there, sitting on his mother's knee, they found him, the baby king. The three men knelt before the little king. They took off their rich royal turbans and gleaming golden crowns. They bowed their noble heads to the ground and gave him their sparkling treasures. The journey that had begun so many centuries before had led three wise men here to a little town, to a little house, to a little child, to the king God had promised David all those years before. But this child was a new kind of king. Though he was the prince of heaven, he had come, and he had become poor. Though he was the mighty God, he had become a helpless baby. This king hadn't come to be the boss. He had come to be a servant. Love that story because it is such the perfect picture of Jesus. That last line, he didn't come to be the boss, he came to be a servant. 
God's love for us is so great, so unimaginably big, that He is a servant serving us. i got to tell you, there is nothing more breathtaking than when you imagine the very God of the universe serving, sacrificing, giving for you and me. And that is a perfect example of how we are to live our lives out of love, right? To serve each other. And so over these next four days, five days, if you're waiting to open your Christmas presents, if you're ready anxiously to open your Christmas stocking, here's what I would encourage you to do. Follow the way of Jesus and serve whoever is around you. Serve your brother, serve your sister, serve your mom, your dad, your grandparents, whoever is right in front of you right now. Serve them. Show them the love that you have for them and the love that God has for them by serving them. Can you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for serving me. Help me to love others by serving them in the way you serve me. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you very much, Megan. That was wonderful. It's beautiful. It's nice to hear uh, a new Christmas uh, song uh, that, and, and one that's good. I got to tell you, you know, there, there's uh, uh, lots of people try to write uh, Christmas music, new stuff. It's not always very good. That was a really good one. I'd never heard that before. Thank you. Uh, so just yesterday, uh, I got a chance to do something that has become a uh, pretty much a new Christmas tradition uh, for our family. Uh, yesterday, we went out to Giant Eagle, which has basically been where we've done it, and uh, we got to ring uh, the bells for the Salvation Army. Now, we started doing this uh, maybe our first Christmas here. I'm not 100% certain of it, but uh, it was Barb Mullen, uh, one of our former staff, who, uh, uh, who helped to lead the effort with the Salvation Army in our area, and reached out and said, hey, would you like, would you guys maybe like to ring the bell? Uh, I never, I don't think I'd ever rung the Salvation Army uh, kettle bell uh, at, uh, at Christmas before, and I thought, sure, let's give it a shot. And uh, we have really had a wonderful experience over the years ringing that bell sometimes uh, we have uh, brought my uh, guitar. Uh, this year we, uh, we brought a list of Christmas carols and, uh, and we sang. Uh, took some, uh, you know, breaks. But uh, we, were, we were masked up and uh, uh, we were uh, trying to observe uh, all the safety protocols. But it was so cool. It was so cool to see uh, a, a hundred different acts of love in that 90 minutes. In fact, we weren't counting. There was probably a lot more than that. Uh, but it's so cool. Uh, the, the, the simple act of saying Merry Christmas and, and thank you. That's about all we said other than singing. And it was just wonderful to see these acts of love by complete strangers who would drop a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars or maybe twenty dollars into this, into this uh, kettlebell for for people that they didn't know, but these acts of genuine, real love reaching out at Christmas, it, it's a tremendous encouragement. Now this morning, uh, again, we are finishing, we're on the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the, uh, the four themes of Advent, the, the four candles, are, are what we've been uh, looking at. And we began with hope, right? And the question that we've kind of been asking is, how is it, that these things can grow in our lives. The first week we looked at the fact that hope uh, can grow uh, as we remember what God has done in our lives, in the lives of people, in the lives of people in our community like, like Dave Garrison. And as we share that information, right? As we, as we remember what God has done and tell others what God has done, this helps our hope to grow. If God has done this in the past, God can do it in the future. And we can continue to put our hope in God. Uh, then we looked at peace. How is it that our peace grows? And it seems our peace grows as we surrender to God. As we surrender ourselves, our lives, our hopes to God. As we praise God and as we bless other people, we discover that our peace is growing. And last week we looked at joy, right? Uh, the, the interesting topic to be looking at on the first Sunday that we were once again not gathering in person. Naturally not feeling a lot of joy in the midst of everything that's going on around us. Joy is a challenge. It's certainly a challenge to manufacture. But we talked about the fact that even if we're not feeling joy or if we're having a hard time finding joy right now that that joy is something that, that, that joy is actually the payoff of the hope so if we put our hope in god if we surrender and rest in god's peace maybe just maybe the joy of the lord will find us this morning we we hit the the fourth theme the theme of love. So I want to read to us, not from a passage at all from the Christmas story, but from the passage uh, late on in the 15th chapter of uh, John's gospel. Jesus uh, is gathered with his disciples. It's the, uh, it's the last night. They are uh, uh, at the last supper. 
John's gospel is, is so unique and different and so wonderful. And, and in John's retelling uh, of, of Jesus' minis- mission and ministry and his life, what he does is, is he puts a whole lot in that final night. Chapter after chapter is focused on this, this teaching, this intimate time that Jesus has with his disciples. So, John chapter 15, hear the word of the Lord, the words of Jesus himself, beginning at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. Here we have, uh, again, this is part of Jesus' uh, final uh, instructions uh, to the disciples there at the Last Supper. Uh, but where we find ourselves here in chapter uh, 15 is uh, right on the tail end of a very famous uh, instruction, uh, parable almost, that Jesus uh, tells. It is all about the vine and the branches. And, and, and it's a parable in that it's a... Uh, uh, instruction about something that is real and known and helps to uh, make sense of something that is a little more complex. But basically, Jesus is saying that, listen, the only way that you can bear fruit, the only thing that something positive can come out of your life is if you are connected to, to the source of life. See, just like, just like there are no grapes born from branches that are not connected to the vine. So you can't bear fruit in your life if you're not connected to God. So Jesus says you need to remain connected to God. True of the matter is, is that if we are going to, if we're going to bear fruit in our lives, then we need to be connected to God. Fruit, love is a fruit So if we are going to bear love, if we are going to experience, if we are going to love, then we need to be connected to Jesus. But we should be clear, love is not, love is not some sweet, squishy sentimentality, right? So many times uh, when people talk about or think about love, what they're thinking about, what they're imagining is just something like that, just some feeling. But the more that we know about love, the more that we see about love, the more that we experience about love, we know that love is so much more, so much bigger. Love is sacrificial. Love is self-sacrificial. Now, we actually look at the, the text, and we actually look at the instructions that Jesus has. Jesus explains this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. First thing you need to realize from this passage is that Jesus is the revelation. Jesus is the example of God's love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. As I have loved you is the way that God has loved me. The way that Jesus interacts with his disciples, the way that Jesus interacts with the world, the way that Jesus has loved is the kind of love that God has in himself. And that love over and over and over again is self sacrificial over and over and over again the love that jesus shows the love that god has is to put himself 
behind everyone else. Over and over and over again, Jesus sacrifices himself for the sake of others. Ultimately, we will see it on the cross, right? Ultimately, Jesus allows himself to be taken, to be arrested. Jesus allows himself uh, to be tortured. Jesus allows himself to be condemned to death, to sentenced to death, and then to hang there on the cross and die. Jesus does that as an act of love for you and for me. Over and over and over again, Jesus shows us the self-sacrificial love of God. And Jesus explains, true love is like this. This is the example. And now the instruction. You need to remain in my love. Right? That's what Jesus says. You need to stay in there. You need to remain connected. You need to stay in my love. And then you need to keep my commands. Now, the, the, the first thought of this is you can remember lots of different things about Jesus' commands, right? Over and over and over again, Jesus gives lots of instruction. And when pressed, when pressed by, by the religious leaders, Jesus even says, listen, I have not come to abolish the law. You have been given the law, right? Moses wrote down law after law after law, instruction for how you are to live in the face of each other and in the face of God. And Jesus said, I'm not here to get rid of that. I'm here to complete it. When we think about the commands of God and the commands of Jesus, that list seems very, very long and very, very big. And yet, Jesus says the summation of that is love. Jesus also explains that I'm your example. Right? Everything you everything you're called to do, you see in me. Everything I want you to do, you see in me, in my actions, and in my life. And there's a purpose to this. We can get off track sometimes when we, when we think that, that God is only out to force us into some mold or some way against our own free will, against our own desires. If God somehow wants to, to, to make us uh, not have any fun. Jesus says very clearly the purpose of this, the reason for this is joy. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. The joy of the, the very God of the universe in you, in us. And that your joy, he says, would be complete, would be full. Joy is the purpose. Jesus is the example. The instructions are to remain in him, to love. And the purpose of this, the reason for this is joy. Joy is the goal, joy is the purpose, joy is the end. It's not begrudging acceptance. It's not a less than life, it is actually full life. Life to the very edge of excitement and beyond. Joy. And then Jesus repeats the instruction just in case we weren't clear. Love one another as I have loved you. All the commands, all the instructions is summed up in that. Love one another. The way that I've loved you sacrificially, putting aside our own self and our own desires, our own hopes and our own dreams for the sake of others. And then the example again, there is nothing greater Love is matched by nothing else, nothing higher, no more perfect example than to lay down one's life for his friends. This is both a, a summation and a pointing to what Jesus is about to do, right? Jesus is going to lay down his life. 
Jesus is going to give it up. Jesus isn't going to hide behind anyone else. Jesus is not going to hide behind his words. Jesus isn't going to hide behind the instructions, the law of God. Jesus is not going to hide behind an army of angels or an army of soldiers. Jesus is not going to hide by running away. Jesus is not going to stand behind anything. He is instead going to lay himself down to accept an unjust sentence. Jesus is going to lay himself down so that the fullness of love might be known and experienced by you and I. The truth of the matter is is that the more we love like that, the more we love others, the more love grows in us. The reverse is true. The more we hold back, the more we hold tightly to our life, the more we hold back what we have, the blessings that we've been given, the more we hold on to our rights and our freedoms and our desires, the more we lose. The more our love fades, the, more we, the less we experience love itself. George Palmer, an Australian, the former gang member, probably said it no better. He said, hatred, the reverse of love, right? Hatred is like a cancer. It doesn't stay dormant. It grows. Love grows when we love others. And the reverse is true as well. Hatred grows as well. Now, George would know. George, George, like I said, was a a gang member in Australia. Uh, George didn't necessarily aspire to be a gang member when he was a toddler, but there was a really uh, challenging event that happened in his early uh, life. George was about seven and a half years old when his father, who had just finished planting a hundred cherry trees, died of a heart attack. George, uh, in those moments afterwards, said to God, I hate you with all of my heart. George was so angry and so bitter towards God at losing his father that it sent him on a terrible, terrible path. Now, he said he had always been told, and he never explained whether it was from his father or from others, he'd always explained that he would never amount to anything, that he was useless, that he would end up on the streets. And he says, you know what, if you tell someone that long enough, they are going to believe it. Anger and bitterness and resentment and hatred grew in George's heart and in George's life to the point that he he says, All he wanted to do was hurt people. He joined a gang, and in one one really, really messy gang fight, he said they took the leader of the opposing gang, and they held his hand down, and they drove a car back and forth over it. George was filled with rage and anger and hatred. One of the people that he really hated was Billy Graham. Billy Graham uh, at this time in 1967 was, uh, you know, at the height of his evangelistic crusades. And uh, he went to Australia to take part in one of these crusades. And when George heard that Billy Graham was coming, he got together with nine other of his friends, the ten of them, and they decided that they were going to go to, Billy Graham, to the Billy Graham crusade, and they would go there for one reason and one reason only, to kill Billy Graham. 
George got 10 zip guns, homemade guns. And they got into the rally and they spread out um, throughout a great distance. And their plan was pretty simple. They were going to wait through all of the uh, preaching and teaching and singing. They were going to wait until the appeal. The appeal was that moment when Billy Graham, after presenting the good news of God's love and sacrifice in Jesus Christ, would invite people to come forward to publicly declare their love for Jesus and their acceptance of him as their Lord and Savior. And people, if you haven't seen one before, people would come down from the highest heights of the bleachers. They would all gather around, and there'd be people there to pray with them, and they'd be crying George thought, this is the perfect time. When everybody is coming, we're going to kill Billy Graham. George listened to the message and waited and bided his time. And at one point in time, he looked around and he said, why in the Dickens are there so many people here? Not too long after that, George heard a voice. Why are you here, George? George. George looked around expecting to see one of his friends or someone else that he knew, but there was nobody near enough to him. Realized in this moment that it was God speaking. George responded, You took my dad. You hurt me so much. Why should I love you? Why should I care about you? God responded to him. I didn't take your dad to hurt you. Indeed, I would never hurt you. Full stop. George said he started to melt in that moment, he thought about for a while. The appeal finally came. George put down his gun. He came forward not with the intent to kill Billy Graham, but the intent to lay down his life and to accept the love of God in Jesus Christ. George explains that one of the most interesting things is that nine out of the ten of them that gathered that day gave their lives to Christ. He said, God took this person that hated him with every part of his being, yet God took him and loved him. It is amazing. He says that God can take a situation like we were in and change your life completely. And I thank him every day for that. I really do. George ended up being commissioned and serving for 30 years in the Salvation Army. Same group that we ring the bells for. Same group that we invite people to give towards sacrificially to love our community. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful example of not only God's love for us, but the way that we can receive that love, that love can grow, that love can have a tremendous impact in the world that we're living in now. Friends, do not doubt the truth of God's love for you. It doesn't matter what pain you have or are experiencing right now. God, be, God could be saying those same words to you that God said to George over 50 years ago. I didn't do that. I would never hurt you. I love you. And I've sacrificed myself so that you would know my love for you. Friends, God has loved us sacrificially when we're connected to him, when we are loving others, 
sacrificially, our love will grow. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you meet us right where we are. God, you meet us in our brokenness. You meet us in our pain. You meet us when we are lost, when we are walking down the wrong path. God, you meet us when we are alone and lonely. God, you meet us right in this moment. And over and over and over again, you have told us, you have whispered, you have shouted those simple words, I love you. God, help us to believe in your love. Help us to trust in your love. Help us to love as you have loved, sacrificially, so that our love might grow. So that our joy might be real and complete and full. God, in these moments, we grateful for your love. We ask that you would give us the strength to live our lives in your love. God, we are brought to mind so many situations. Individuals in our community, those who are suffering under the weight of the financial burdens that this pandemic has brought on. Brought to mind small businesses, individuals who have lost their jobs. Lord God, we're brought to mind those who are sick. Got sick with COVID, sick with other diseases suffering with cancer, needing organ transplants, brought to mind those who suffer with addictions, and isolation, and the holidays, and their natural times only bring out more and more stress. Now we bring to mind the natural order of this world disasters that come upon us and simple issues like snowfall and rain that can cause havoc not only on our roads but throughout our world. God, we lift up to you our prayers. God, we lift them up to you in our hearts and aloud and on our screens. God, we trust that you hear us. And so we bind together our voices and our hearts to pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power of and the glory forever. Amen.
gathered and being gathered by the love of Jesus Christ into a community of faith. We have given and exchanged that love, and we're now sent out into this world to share it, to welcome people to grow in Jesus. In every and any way that you are out, you are enabled and empowered to live the love of Jesus, to share it with others so that it might grow, so that your joy, so that Christ's joy, so that our joy would be complete. Four days from now, we will gather online for worship on Christmas Eve. I'd invite you to make sure that you have a candle with you uh, for, Chris, for that Christmas Eve service. Uh, we will sing Silent Night to close out this service. We've got some very special, very unique experiences that we're looking forward uh, to sharing with you. It will be a special celebration no matter what. Make sure you have a candle. You won't want to miss out. But hear these final words of good news. Friends, the love, may the love of God be in you, growing. May it flow out of you in your words and your actions. May it be completed in all and everything that you do as you sacrificially love this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, go in peace.